All right, so today we're going to be talking about Weaver, a generic dependency injection container for LabVIEW. Uh, so, who am I? My name is Philippe Gary. I'm a partner and principal engineer at JKI. I am a certified LabVIEW architect, and I've been using LabVIEW for 22, 23 years, something like that. <coughs> okay. Okay, first of all, you know, if you see those people around, you know, that had to organize the GLA Summit from scratch, we give them a big thank you because it was a lot of work to do. And compared to the CLA, that was already kind of a well running machine. So thank them if you see them around. So I do thanks to them right now. All right, so what's going to be on the agenda? <clears throat> So we're going to briefly talk about dependency injection. And I say briefly because I want to focus mostly on example. Then we're going to look at the Weaver design goal. Then look at example most of the time. And what are the limitations of Weaver? A limitation due to the framework itself and a limitation due to lab. <coughs> so what is dependency injection? But all are part of the solid principle, which is a term run by Robert C. Martin, and the D is for the dependency inversion principle. A few people today have already spoke about it, Stephen Mercer, Newton, and John McGee. And he uh, said that one should depend upon abstraction and not concretion. <coughs> but what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a component, and you will also have the terminology I call a client, it should depend on an abstraction. So for instance, if I have a stage, <coughs> and the stage is an XY stage, and uh, your, your goal in this software that you are writing for that XY stage is to be able to test multiple axes, maybe some axes for high speeds, some axes for high accuracy, and you might be able to mix and match. Well, the principle says you should depend on an abstraction for an axis. And uh, at one time, you will get the proper implementation. So you would have the stage depend on two axes. And the axis, you would have different type of axis based on what you want to do. <coughs> now, how do you implement that pattern? Well, you do what I just described on, on the first step. And in addition, Externally to the code of the stage, you inject the axis that you need at runtime from the outside. This is a pattern that you can implement, and you don't need to have a framework to do that. It's a totally very good pattern that leads a lot of good results, such as testability. You can decouple your code, and you can reuse it more easily. So what does a dependency injection container? It's also called an IOC for a version of control container. But what the dependency injection container do, it automates the process of describing the relationship between the pieces and doing the injection of those pieces so that you don't have to do that manually. So just remember that this container thing is basically something that automate the work. <clears throat> All right. So there is a lot of the IOC container in other languages. And I, I we need quite a few of those to kind of get to Weaver. So for instance, in C Sharp, we have Inject. We have Autofact. I haven't actually not looked at this one. Inject is pretty good, very good documentation. Simple injector, so very good documentation. In Java, we have Spring, and I think Spring was one, if not the first one, of the dependency injection framework we used in programming. <coughs> I think it was in early 2000 or something like that. Then we have Google Juice. Then we have Google Dagger. So in LabVIEW, we really don't have anything as of yet. So now we have Weaver. <coughs> All right, so what are the design goals for Weaver? Well, the first design goal is that Weaver shall work with any classes. And what that means that if you have already existing code, existing class that already implement the dependency and inversion principle, Weaver should work with those classes. 
second uh, design goal. Weavers shall not require classes to be modified in order to be managed by the framework. Again, same uh, as before, you have existing classes. You should not have to do any modification to those classes to be able to add them to work with the framework. For instance, that class could be um, protected or something like that. And you, don't have, you should not have to modify it to be able to be uh, injectable and managed by the framework. <coughs> and finally, Weaver shall not require class specific code to be written for a class to be managed by the framework. And when that means that, then for a given class, even though Weaver may work with them, Weaver may not require any change to the class. But you should not have to write any you know, specific code for that class to be managed by the framework. So that's the three goals for Weaver. And we'll review how good I was able to do in creating uh, Weaver. <coughs> so the example are on VIPM.io. So if you go and hopefully you will have more package for the GLA Summit. So the entire Weaver is available for download to test it. And uh, the code I'm going to show I just instead of this one. All right, so. Okay, so uh, first thing, so this is, you know, an alpha. I packaged it. I did, I haven't used this in the production yet. I used part of it in the production, but not the full thing. So, you know, it's likely to have a lot of dusty corner or rusty, rusty nail that we used to call the, you know, the scripting in the past. So, if it blew up in your face, destroy your computer, whatever, you know, don't come and complain. <laughs> oh, and in terms of uh, live view, I, de I developed Weaver in uh, 2015, but because in 2020 we got uh, interfaces, I had to migrate everything to 2020 to test these interfaces. So just letting you know right now, if you don't have 2020, well, you are out of luck for that package. All right, so let's just look in the code. <clears throat> All right, if you guys see Jim's presentation, I have the Project Dragon. Yeah, open me my little project for Weaver. Oh, is a framework for Is that not too bad? See correctly for now, yeah. Okay. All right, so in the example, the main example I'm going to use, I have another one, more of a real one, uh, real world example, but I have basically that axis I talk about, uh, which has two, uh, pardon me, that stage that has two axes. So the axis API, you can uh, own it, you can get the name of that axis, set position, get position. And I know Stephen Mercer say we, we should not put an I in front of axis to define the uh, interface. So this is not an interface as of yet, because again, the code was developed in 2015, but it could be an interface. Right now, it's just an abstract person. No, nothing in the private data or empty. And you can own the stage, set the position, get position from the abstraction, and those methods are dynamic dispatch. That goes to the child to essentially do the work and use little private data for the position. That's what we have there. So very simple example, but we're gonna see how that works. How we do a, <coughs> a version of control and how does it work with Weaver. All right, so again, if you use a dependency injection principle in your code, what you will typically see is that pattern where you have a couple of components that have dependency on each other. You will create the component that you need, then you will inject the dependency into the, the client. Again, terminology, in this case, the user of dependency is called the client. And then you do your real world, your real work, basically your business logic about what you need to do with that component. And then actually, when everything is done, you need to do a little bit of cleanup. It's destroy your axis in a reverse order because you, know, you want to destroy them properly in order and then uh, destroy, uh, destroy the stage. So just to give it a quick test, it doesn't work fine. 
<coughs> so I just create test, so the name is test. I'm going to try to go to position five. Minus three. All right, so the position is five minus three, so the, this thing works fine. Okay. So even though this type of code uh, is very small, basically when you start to use that pattern for uh, creating larger code, basically you end up seeing those giant VI. I mean, this one is not that big to be honest, but you, you see one where you create all those objects. Uh, you can uh, create them in the right order and then you inject. This is kind of the dependency injection part where you inject your dependencies inject dependency and so on and so forth. And here you have, again, in this case, the business logic it will just be listened to a shutdown signal. And then we kind of uh, close everything and clean up everything at the end of the, <coughs> uh, of the run. So this is a typical use case where you see a inversion of control being used when you do everything manually. All right. So now, what does Weaver do differently? Well, remember, this is all that boilerplate could be talking about. So what Weaver does, basically, it allows you, so this is, you create a container, then you define the relationship between the component. So you might say to Weaver, using some sort of syntax, you might say, hey, you know, the stage is going to have a dependency on a couple of axes of type ni axis. We're also going to have a dependency on a variable by value. It's a string that has a value ni motion in there. And please give me an instance of stage. So I describe what the relationship are, and then I ask in step two, Weaver to provide me with, a with a, uh, an instance of stage. Then I will get that instance, do my business logic, I do that same kind of thing. And then I will call River Cleanup that will take care of doing all that stuff for you. So basically, you end up all the, and it does the kind of the auto wiring part, or it just you know, create a thing. It does not script some code, but what it does behind the scene, it just call the proper VI in the proper order, passing them the proper argument. So Weaver basically replaced all the thing in the purple block. So I hope this is clear enough to describe what's going on with Weaver from that perspective. All right, so you might say, well, how helpful this is, it would be to do that. Well, one of the interesting aspects to do that is you can then uh, you don't have to, but you can then use a file that will describe your item, and then you might describe the relationship and the, uh, the binding in a file. So you can very easily, you know, inject a tester instead of uh, a mock object tester instead of a you know, concrete implementation that talks to the hardware or a simulator or something like that. So in this case, I'm Again, it's a, this weaver does not provide uh, support for file, because weaver is just a core container, but you could have something on top of it. And in this case, I'm just describing different type of uh, object and give them an ID. And then I have injection directive when I say, inject the thing ID X axis into the thing called my stage via the stage inject using the default provider and tag in the, in the control name x-axis, which in this case would be, you know, inject this into this in this control name here. Maybe that's what I will describe. Okay, so far no questions, so the facts, we are good. All right, so now we're gonna see how Weaver already works. So here I have this, I think this one I can close it now. So I have again the same example. Oops, should not look at this yet. Okay. 
So if I do it manually, again, this is the same code as here. You know, I pass a variable in iMotion. I'm creating my two x and y axis. I have some business logic in the middle, and I have some cleanup. And by the way, here is the UML diagram for Weaver. I know a lot of people like to see that. I personally like too, so I'll keep it there. You guys can look at it as I look at uh, the demo that we have. All right, so if I run this one again, same as before. Okay. Not very exciting, but the position, okay, that's the position to be set and the home. Okay, so this is the the default way of operating without weaver. So now next frame, basically I have one way to use weaver. Okay. So before we go to that little bit more detail how that thing works, let's look at some terminology. <coughs> so and I have talked with this at people at JKI, and nobody liked that terminology, and I apologize. I just use uh, Wikipedia terminology for dependency injection container. It's not the greatest, but OK, that's what I use. So the terminology that the thing that is a dependency is going to be called a service, and the user of the dependency is going to be called a client. So this is what Wikipedia using the verbiage, but I just skip it to the service is a dependency and the client is a user of the dependency. So now one thing to realize is that that relationship is not static. It's not like you say, like the stage always has a dependency on X axis. It's if you have, for instance, a relationship where A has a dependency on B has a dependency on C. Well, when you define the relationship for A, you're going to say A is a client and B are the service because B is a dependency of A. And when you define the relationship for B, B is a client and C is a service. And you can imagine as you drill down uh, deeper and deeper, you have the same kind of thing happening like at each level. Okay, so this is the terminology. And if somebody has a better one, I could potentially replace that in the future, but for now, we stick with that that uh, Wikipedia use and other place use. Right, so here we have that VI, which is basically, I call it an easy binding. So it's not verbose at all. And it made a lot of assumptions that I will explain a little bit in a minute. But basically what you say in that VI, say, hey, and this VI, you know, can use, uh, you know, again, uh, a path. Uh, here you can put the class, or you can put the path to the class, or a string that we on the class, or whatever. And in New York, to make it simple, I just put a, uh, a constant to the class. But it says, okay, the uh, client stage needs those following services. So there's two services. One is a bar value uh, string that has the content of an emotion. And those are one, it's a mutable type, you know, uh, a, a class of type NI axis. And that's all you say. You just say, I have a stage is going to need those two of those. And basically, Weaver, once you call this method, you say, hey, and this you don't need it, it's just for the polymorphic selection. Now I might use some VI, I mean a future manable VI to make it a little bit easier here. But here you say, hey, Weaver, please provide me with an instance of type I should say, uh, stage. And Weaver will provide you, and because you may have multiple stage instances, so you get an array. So here I know I only have get one. So you get your stage instance, you cast it. And then business as usual. You have your business call here that does whatever it's supposed to do. And uh, in there, after that, you can do the cleanup. So let's see, and hopefully, I will run. That'll be great. Okay. So move to position. And home. Okay. So this works. So now, basically, this code is equivalent to this code, sort of. I mean, it achieved the same functionality in a different way. 
Okay. No questions so far? No? Yes. That's good. <clears throat> okay, so this is the uh, kind of the way where we've made a lot of assumptions. And uh, I'm going to explain some of those assumptions a little bit uh, later to figure out how to inject the right thing in the right place. So now we're going to look at the next example. So this one, we're going to go... So if you go also in the palette where that thing is installed, so basically, there is two ways to add relationship. So we use that the first example, the easy add binding. And now we're going to add the other add binding, which is more uh, explicit. So now we're going to add another concept in this, the interface, again, come from Wikipedia. And I use it in a slightly different way that is defined in Wikipedia, but the way to, to uh, understand it, you can say this is a VI that is going to be receiving the service. That's kind of one way to kind of think about it. So in this case, now we, we, we have a, a new function which is called add binding. It's more generic and you can be add variables as you want with this one. So now we have, if you look at it, it has like four type of inputs. It has the, a bunch of basically a binding descriptors. So you have uh, the green one is a client descriptor. Then you have uh, the interface descriptor and then you have the service descriptor. And then basically now you say the service will need, uh, pardon me, the client will need the service via the interface. So in this case, what I say is that the stage is declaring that it needs a service of type NI axis in that interface. And I'm creating that binding and then you go ahead and request from the uh, container to give us again an instance of type stage. So now you see there is something else connected here. So what is that thing? That gets where it gets. This is where we start to have deviation from other IOC container. So in LabVIEW, well, before I say in LabVIEW, in other programming languages, you have explicit constructor and explicit destructor that can be easily uh, found and uh, you can have code that said, hey, you know, I, I can totally find this uh, constructor or descriptor. I can identify it. So I, I know that I need to inject stuff in, uh, in that constructor or descriptor. In LabVIEW, we don't have explicit constructor or descriptor. The only thing we have in a class are method. So, as you can tell here, I have two places where I inject stuff. I inject a variable here, and I inject uh, dependencies on other classes. So I cannot need to have some sort of mean to identify which place I want to inject stuff. And this is what that at inject is. So, and this is where we're going to start to explain how the previous framework so I created a concept of context. And basically, a weaver, we connect three contexts by default, a create context, a inject context, and a destroy context. So this way, if you, you are able to tell weaver that a given operation is pointing to a specific target. And for instance, you might say, oh, I'd like first to do all the creation of all the things. So here you will say, okay, I just want to have add create. Yeah. And at that point, the only thing we are going to do is all the things that has been defined add create. If you don't say that, if you don't connect it, it's going to try to do add create and add inject. But in this case, 
because I did not define anything uh, specific. And this where you specify this, and I probably going to start to lose people. This way, it gets a little bit airy. You define at the interface what type of interface this is. So in this case, by default, it's at inject. Even though I didn't say which VI this was, but the trick that I used, those keywords that we will recognize, they have used in the VI name. So because the VI name contains those keywords, now Weaver is able to identify automatically uh, those contexts. So essentially what's gonna happen here on this specific example, I just say, do those things here, oops, sorry, only on, on the at inject context. The at inject context is this one. So I'm not gonna get anything set up in base. Instead, I'm only gonna do the injection in this. And given here, it's a very simple example that I have. I'm not doing anything like of substance in my creation. That's gonna work fine. Let me run the example, All right? So here, you're gonna, not gonna see this set up properly because I'm essentially not doing it. I'm only doing this part here. All right, so now I'm gonna move the position and I'm gonna run it. So this part is a little bit tricky, but hopefully I didn't lose everybody on that part. Okay, so now, we're gonna do now the crit that we haven't said before. So in the next example, basically, I'm gonna say, okay, well, and you see there's a little difference here. So before for my uh, client, I did not give it a name because I said, I don't care, you know, one instance, multiple instance, it doesn't matter. But here, if I don't give a name, basically making a unique instance, name instance for this client, Basically, I will get one client for this relationship and another one for this one. So in this case, I give it a unique name and I say, okay, now I have a stage and give it a name. This is my client and it's called George. We still have the same thing we talked about it previously. And now for George, we also say, I'd like to have a, a service and it's a value and I motion and I'd like to inject it in a context, which is at create, an interface is at create for me. And again, because I have the right naming and everything, I don't have to specify the VI path that it refer to. Weaver can figure it out by itself. If he would not be able to get it figured by itself, he would have an error at one time. So right now I'm gonna go to this. Okay, so now I have the NI motion that I said up here, position and all. So <clears throat> now we have been able to define those two relationships. Okay, time five thirty. So this one, I'm gonna skip this one, let's go to the next one. So now we were kind of uh, implicit, but now we're gonna get a little bit more explicit. So in the previous thing, there was a lot of things that was not defined. If you see that uh, the connector panel, those things, and it looks like I need to add the description on this one. Oh, it looks like I didn't do a lot of description here. The connector panel, those things, you have a lot more, more input that you can specify. And if you want to be absolutely certain that Weaver is going to give you what you want, you should really define all those inputs. Otherwise, Weaver is going to look at things and try to guess the best way possible. Okay, so in this example, again, we have our client called George. Now we're gonna say, we need an instance, I'm gonna give it a name, an X instance of that NI axis. The interface, now I'm gonna define better. I'm gonna say the interface is this VI, okay, this in this VI, this control name X axis, so this guy, and it has to be of this type, the I axis, yeah. And in addition to that, I'm just saying that this VI that I'm just telling you about, it's in the inject context. 
And why you would want to do that, remember one of the requirements that I have for the design of River is that it should work with existing class. And I'm pretty sure nobody in the world right now is using those annotations at inject. But once you define a VI like this and you say it's part of the at inject uh, context, now later on when you use that context, we will know that you have tagged that VI is at inject, so that's the one you need to look for. This is for the x-axis, so now we go for the y-axis, essentially the same thing. And now we just say again, send the eye, but we'd like to receive it inside the y-axis. Again, we haven't said anything about injecting that an eye motion barrier. So once I run this one, again, we, we are requesting the uh, at inject only. Once I run this one, I'm only going to get uh, the uh, motion to move, not the, the name, because we didn't define the relationship for the name. So this is the right one. Okay. Move to position. Boom. Oh, that's still working. So here I put a note that there's a new input here. That there's a fourth item when you define the relationship is the how you're going to do that injection. And the how is an injection provider that basically is a mechanic of how the injection is going to be done. Say, for instance, the run VI method or a call bar reference, which is unfortunately strictly typed, so you will have to create multiple injection provider. Ideally, you will not have to worry about any of that stuff. And we will look at some of the limitation, that limitation that's you have to kind of look at those stuff right now. But right now, you don't have to wait too much about the injection formula. Basically, this is the full, first piece that also we, Wikipedia uh, talk about. They call it the injector in Wikipedia. OK, so now next one, and it gets very buzzier, because now we are being variables with pretty much everything. So basically, this is the same as before, OK? No change, except now we say, OK, I'm going to talk about this guy here. I'm going to describe the relationship for this guy. So I say, okay, once again, this is about George, our service called George. We need to have a control value. This tab is not a class, it's a control value. This is my service. I need to be inject in that create function in the control called instance name and uh, the uh, context is add create. So now I've been very, very verbose. I'm describing everything. And then I say again, just give me an instance of Josh. So this time, interestingly, I don't, I didn't look at it too much earlier, but I no longer ask for a type. I could ask for the type. Instead, I'm asking for the instance by name instead of asking for a type. So the, the type I could get uh, potentially more than one, but this one I know is called George. So say I have two or three, uh, you know, stage in my system, I'm requesting a, a specific name one. Okay, so this is, uh, which one is this one? I cannot get it last. I create, I inject, yeah, that's the right one. Yeah, this one next. Okay. Okay, we get the inner motion coming from here. We need to position, and we can all. <coughs> right, and we can stop. So, motion not too bad. So, one thing I didn't talk too much yet is that because basically what this function does basically, this is where all the magic happens. So, it, it recursively. Uh, drill to the, the map of the hierarchy, find all the places where you need to create instances, create the instance from the bottom up. And if you have a mean to identify the place that are the destructor, if you have destructor in your system, again, you have a keyword at destroy. Then when, we, when you destroy the container, River will do the destruction in the reverse order of the creation, basically. So you, you will be doing it uh, you know, 
without you having to do any of that, of that code, basically, if we replace that code. So I'm lucky, I guess, there's not too many people in the presentation because there's not too many questions. But I was. Philip, maybe maybe I can I can ask one question here. I guess you're preparing us for uh, that that XML file type of configuration of system configuration that you've shown at the beginning. So, uh, is is that something that Weaver does? Uh, no, we, Weaver is a container. So basically, a a, a container, the function of a container, a street main function, which is you register the relationships, you reserve the dependency graph and provide instance, and you release the create in assembly. Sometimes they create the tree R. So this is the core functionality of Weaver. So you, you, I, I basically what I created, I created a, a semantic syntax that lets you define the relationship of thing. So granted, you're gonna tell me, well, for sure, this is not more easier to write than it is to write this. I will agree with that statement. But what that allow you now, it allow you to create that file aspect of it that you can put on top of it. You know, I think that's one benefit. Also, I was hoping, I mean, on this right now it's very simple, but one might argue that it's not more complete. I mean, basically, this code here is replaced by this, and it's also replacing this. So, you know, at that case, at that point in time, you start to ask, well, you know, it's not that lot worse. You know, I just very loosely say, hey, you know, I need those things, figure out where they go. And uh, that's what I'm caring about. So I honestly don't expect people to use the syntax as such. Probably going to require to have a file on top of it, but there are a lot of all those various examples I provide initially between uh, C Sharp and uh, Java. Some are geared totally toward the file, like Spring. We use uh, an XML file with we call bins that completely define the relationship. That's the only way you do anything in Spring. And then there is a lot of other ones where it's a lot more like this. You define syntax. Unfortunately, I think this is one place where LabVIEW is not. I mean, it's a lot easier to do that with uh, text programming languages to define relationship, because you can come up with a syntax very easily that takes very you know, one line of code, like you know, this, what I have in this XML, basically we see something like this in some of those languages, and it's very easy to define. And now to do the equivalent, I have to write you know, the entire thing here. Yeah? So it's a lot more heavy looking, but you know. I, I, I just wanted to focus to the core functionality and allow enough syntax uh, that we can add more things on top of it later. Thanks. If you have time for another question. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. What about um, an object, injecting an object that is already created and running? Let's say I have a process that's already running, and instead of composition, I want to achieve aggregation. Is that something that Weaver supports? Uh, so, <clears throat> um, one thing that I think is simple injector, I think it's, it's a bad practice is that once you, okay, once you have start requesting instances, you can no longer add new binding because you, if you do that, you can create, uh, and that's a proper word, uncertainty in your object map because you can define stuff that would overwrite what's already existing. So I would say that if the proper relationship are defined ahead of time, because this, you know, you can request, you know, you can have a very giant map and you say, I just want to get the bottom part of it or the last two items on the bottom or just that chunk or whatever. So this will you just provide you an instance and it, it, it does internally cache everything that's going on. So once you have, for example, request George, if you request George another time later, it's going to give you the same one. It's not going to create a brand new instance of George. So other uh, IOC container, they have another concept of lifetime. I don't think I have it here. No, they have other concept of lifetime where you can specify at the relationship if an object is instance is a singleton 
uh, is transient. So meaning every time you request one, you're going to get a new one. And because a lot of the framework we are tied to the web, they, so they can be tied to also a HTTP request or some sort of web-related functionality. I could not figure out a good way of doing that in LabVIEW with what we typically do. So I thought the only thing that I did was, well, I implicitly, not explicitly, have a singleton and transition because as long as an instance is not named, every time you ask River to provide you something, and if it's not named, the binding does not refer, refer to the same instance. So the, then here you will have three different instances. So the one that you will have an array of three here, well, it is no name. So let's say instead of George, it would be the type, you know, would be a stage. So you would three of them, and one would be, we have done this, one would have done this, depending on what you call the, the context that you call also. So I could not resolve that nicely, so that's what I, I've got, basically. OK, thanks, Philip. So I have. Uh, I have a couple of slides also at the end to talk about limitation. I have another example which I cleaned up by this stuff and I realized that I cleaned up by this stuff and moved. Oh, what did I click on? Carefully. I moved the VI that has the example in there. So I'll just give me a second. So, Philippe, just as a cue, you have another about eight, 10 minutes uh, before maybe opening for no questions you can. Yeah, a few more minutes. So where, where is that with that example? Thanks, Master. Entitle four, I think that's where I talk about the copy name. Well, right, that's the one. <laughs> okay, go back there. So let's go back. Okay, so this is the real example. So this also was, I had submitted this type of presentation, but uh, I didn't do this one. So. This one, we have a real world example. I have a, a bridge pattern, and this, uh, this thing is supposed to launch uh, other thing. So I create the proxy call. And the proxy call, I have a specific implementation, not an implementation, an interface. So the, in my mind, what the proxy, what the bridge pattern does, it allows you to abstract the interface, not as the sense of an interface in view, but your API. So for the proxy call here, I have the proxy call, which is VI EXE. And then I have a call implementer, which I'm using the run VI method in there. So you can do it like this. So this is the way, uh, sorry, the typical way I'm creating my uh, proxy call of type VI EXE. I say, go ahead and use the run VI method. I have my typical, you know, random shard generator thingy that I want to launch asynchronously. And I, I'm going to pass it an argument to the name here. I'm going to pass a GLS in 2020. So if I run it, I go, okay, pass it GLS in 2020, and you just run nothing fancy. Or I can use Weaver to do the same thing. Create my container. I say, hey, you know, this is my client. This is my dependency on my uh, call implementer. I'd like to use the run VI method then please give me an instance of the proxy call, proxy call via EXE. I cast it. And then again, so that this is my business logic. And you know. So I go and then I achieve the same result. This is more of a real world example in place. Philip, you have a question from Hope. It seems mm -hmm. that like this type of thing would be more useful if you are using by reference objects. Would there also be cases, use cases for by value objects? Well, I think uh, I think Hope is correct, but you can still. So it's all it all depends on how much work you do before you. Okay, let me let me we go back to the example. Let me see the workflow comparison. So if, so those are all by value, okay? Yeah. If you were to do a, a lot of thing in between those two steps, that would be a problem because Weaver will not do this for you. Weaver just do the create. So, and again, you can flatten those two in one. 
I just provide in the framework the capability to have an injection of dependency different for the constructor. In some of my own reusable that I've been uh, creating lately, I flatten everything. So not if I have one year, but basically I flatten everything into one because I find it more convenient. So let's assume it's all flattened into one, but at that point in time, it's still pretty useful because the object by value that you constructed at that point is good. There's no, you know, nobody elsewhere in parallel has done anything with it. So you pass it to your business logic. And if you do all the initialization of things you need to do, in, and then when you call the destructor, it uses what was done in initialization, it's still all good. So there's a bunch of if, you know. Should that not be the case, then yes, that would be limited because what River does, it, 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 it is a cache. That's why it's called a container. It's a cache of all your subjects. So you can request them. But for instance, I request you, you, you run it, you requested this, and then 10 minutes later, you say, hey, River, give me uh, that same instance of, you know, George. It's going to give you the George from 10 minutes ago. It's not going to give you the George of now that you may have, you know, modified uh, your private data and everything. So, yeah. That being the case, though, it is my understanding that your code should not have any awareness of river, except at the edge, which is in the loader. The loader knows about the dependency injection framework or the container. Everything else in your code should have no knowledge whatsoever about the container. And the reason why is that if later on somebody came up with a better container or better way of doing dependency injection, you just replace the container and your code still work. There is no coupling between your code and the dependency injection uh, container. We have another question from Daniel. How would you imagine configuration injection would work for the dependence, dependency classes? Would they all need to manage their own configuration? I, um, I, so Weaver is not, if I understand properly, um, Weaver doesn't make any decision. I and mean, I think the question is that, would it be one file, multiple file, or something like that? that am I reading the question right? Yeah, so in this case, it would be something above Weaver. So say, you know, you, you're familiar with it, say Raffle. It might be a, you know, something above Weaver that would define how they want to do it. Doesn't matter, Weaver does not care. As long as the construction of uh, the binding is properly done, Weaver does not care. It's not Weaver's role to figure this out. I'm gonna go back to finish. I have just a couple more slides with you uh, and then a couple more questions potentially. So, the no limitation. I start to use a lot of variable VI, and I've realized, well, because I did uh, the main development in 2015, I don't support that. I'm going to have to do something about it. The DVR of classes, I put uh, early support in there, but it's not working. And so don't even try to do this. And if you try to inject argument in nested data structure, you know, instead of being very flat, like, you know, dependence in X axis, Y axis. That sort of work, but not the way I want it. And we have the lab view limitation. So first one, uh, reflection, this is a term used in software engineering to talk about code, able to look at itself to figure out what it's made of. Also, for instance, I need to inspect the connector plane of the eye to figure out what needs to be injected into those VI. So there is almost no reflection capability in the runtime engine. And what's available and basically there's some bug in there, and oh, it doesn't work. Oh, it only works if you load all the class in memory. So for me, it's kind of a, a no starter. If I have to load all the class into memory before I can do anything, that would that thing would be unusable because some class dependency could be large. So as a result, I have to create a registry that you need to carry around and basically you need to change those parts to point to the proper implementation of the class. And this way is really final. All the method and all the ancestor, and that works also with uh, interfaces. 
And that's one limitation. It's not the worst one on all the limitation, but it's one. Okay. The worst one is the next one. There is no generic mean in LabVIEW to automatically run an EVI without undesirable side effect. And in this case, you can do call by reference, so you can do uh, call and forget, call and collect, though they are strictly type, so that means it's not generic. You can do run VI method, there is several side effects. One of the side effects that you need to preserve the front panel, otherwise you cannot do that in an executive call. The worst side effect though is that it's the VI that is being run uh, using the run VI method is run top level. When you run stuff top level, as soon as uh, the VI is done running, every resource that's been created in that VI is cleaned up. So if you create queue, uh, user event, reference of any kind, they, dead, they are dead as soon as you are done running that VI, which is very unfortunate. So if there's one thing that is enabled from NI, which I think is unlikely given the few people there that are here, this is the one thing I love to be fixed. And there are, there is already a suggestion by Webby to have a run of survey. VI. Essentially what we need to have, the cold chain need to stay inside the color of this. So if you run this method, basically, everything that's happened a lifetime need to be tied to the color. So that's the biggest limitation, unfortunately. So what about the Weaver design goal? So yeah, we got that one. Yes, we got that one. Well, because of what I just said, we don't have that one. So this one, those injection provider are there. It's kind of a wrapper that you will receive the argument and you're gonna say, okay, so now I have to do a call by reference or whatever to make that work. This is unfortunate because that you end up writing more code that you want. Although if your constructor, there is trick that you can do to have your constructor now use variant or other trick, but it's not nice. That will require you to make change to your class. Okay, so the code is at not IO. And again, that's like uh, oh, like we have an animation here. Yeah, there you go. The we were dancing. 